Hello, and welcome to the Vedic Conversation, where each episode, we take a different topic and look at it through the lens of storytelling and from the perspective of the Veda, an ancient but very much still relevant body of knowledge from India. I'm Derek Yanford, a Vedic meditation teacher based here in New York City, and I'm joined by my Vedic colleagues Anthony Thompson in London and Rory Kinsella in Sydney. This episode was recorded at the end of May and we're talking about fear. We look at how when we're able to overcome our fears, we're able to move past the things that hold us back. But first, sit back and listen to our stories and then we'll dive into the conversation. As always, don't forget to stick around until the end where we'll offer a practical exercise in how you can apply this knowledge in your daily life. When I was growing up, we were lucky enough to visit Africa a few times because my dad is originally from South Africa. And one trip we went to Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe, which is this really awe-inspiring place. Um, And near our hotel, there's this famous bungee jump that goes off the bridge that goes over the river Zambezi that links Zimbabwe um, and Zambia on the other side. And the border's actually in the middle of the bridge. And I can remember quite vividly standing on this bridge and looking out towards the churning water and these rapids below, which are over a hundred meters down in the ravine. And I had this pretty big fear of heights and I could barely even get near the edge to take a look over, that's how uncomfortable I was. Um, And I have two sisters, um, one who's older and one who's younger, and we were all teenagers at the time, and I had this really embarrassing situation where both my sisters had the guts to jump off the bridge, and I didn't. You know, in the end, my sisters jumped off and they were both fine doing it, but years later, I remember telling everyone how I'd made the right decision because there was this news story of this poor Australian woman who had the cord break on her when she was jumping off the bridge. She fell the whole 100 meters down into the river, which is bad enough when you think about what the impact of the water must have been like. But then you also have to factor in the the rapids that were there um, that she had to navigate, bearing in mind that her ankles are still tied together. And on top of that, you have to factor in that there are crocodiles in this river. But miraculously, she survived with only a broken collarbone. But for me, it was like this small victory and my reluctance to jump had been vindicated, even though it was something like the first accident they'd ever had in tens of thousands of jumps. And then there was this uh, another time years later when I was in New Zealand, when I chickened out of um, the bungee jump off the bridge in Queenstown. Um, And it's actually one of my joke claims to fame that I've bottled out of some of the finest bungee jumps in the world. So when it came to my 40th birthday a few years ago, and my friends were asking me what I wanted as a gift, I decided it was finally time to overcome my fears by doing a skydive. And I'd been meditating for, I think, four years at this point, and I hadn't really tested my fear of heights, um, so I thought I'd be terrified on the day. But the funny thing was that I felt fine. I went with a friend of mine and it was a couple of hours drive south of Sydney and she was so nervous the whole time that for the whole build up it was really spoilt for her. But the sensation that I used to feel in my stomach as nerves or anxiety, I now felt as a kind of excitement or anticipation. And on the video from the day, I'm joking with the instructors and I'm smiling ear to ear the whole time. Um, And even when I was shuffling towards um, the door and dangling my legs out of the window with the instructor behind me, I'm still fine. And then we were tumbling through the air and it took a couple of seconds to catch my breath, but then I was just loving it, loving the whole thing. It was pure adrenaline and pure joy. And whatever had caused my fear of heights, I'd realized had dissolved. And when I tell people that I think that it's meditation that that did this for me, they often laugh and don't believe me. They're thinking, how on earth could these two things have anything to do with each other? But that's the beauty of it. Fears and phobias are just certain types of stress, certain types of stress triggers that we carry around with us. And if you put in the work to meditate every day, month after month, year after year, all these fears start dissolving. And it's not like I set out to work on my fear of heights, and I didn't even notice things beginning to shift. 
And it wasn't until I went through the experience that I saw the proof for myself. And it's things like this that make meditation such a fascinating journey. It was a wet and windy day and I decided to take the underground, the metro subway, to work rather than my usual 40 minute walk. It was rush hour and the carriages were crammed with people, all feeling rather damp and uncomfortable. The ride was a two-stop journey which would take about eight minutes. But on this occasion it took considerably longer because after a few minutes the train stopped in one of the tunnels. In those days the driver had no way of making announcements to the passengers, so nobody knew why we were stationary and how long it was going to last. Now, it's not unusual for trains to pause before getting to the next station because there's usually another train ahead and the wait is typically just a few moments. The carriage became very quiet as everybody was thinking about what was going on. And then, after about three to four minutes, people started to get tetchy. Somebody started to make a commotion and talk loudly about how they were going to be late for work. Moments later, somebody else started to show signs of distress. They were gasping for breath and saying how they couldn't breathe and that we were going to be trapped in the tunnel and never get out. Now, everybody was probably having the same thoughts, but keeping them to themselves. Once those fears were expressed and shared, fear escalated and spread quickly through the carriage. Some people were crying or fainting as the heat intensified. Others were trying to force open the doors. It became an intensely ex distressing experience. But what was it that everybody was frightened of? It wasn't the first time a train had got stuck or broken down, and always after a while the situation is resolved. But people were thinking, maybe this time it's different, and we're on the brink of a tragedy. And that's ultimately what people are frightened of, death. On that train, people might have been thinking, I'll get fired because I'm late again, and if I'm out of work, I can't pay my rent and that might mean I become destitute and have to live on the streets and, 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 and eventually dying. When you analyse what you're frightened of and follow it right back to the root, you'll find that it's fear of death, fear of the unknown experience of death, which is the driver, the catalyst for this strongest of emotions. The Vedic worldview teaches us that this is an instance of the small self being in control. We've allowed ourselves to view our life through a restricted perspective that we and we alone are the most important thing and everything is about us. There's a fear of loss of control, which means we're no longer able to determine the outcome. And we always want the outcome to be with us alive and able to tell the story. When we meditate, we're allowing ourselves to rest very deeply to the point where we transcend thought and connect with what the Vedas call the Absolute. Everything out there which is apparently not us, but it is. We're connecting with nature's intelligence and are no longer immersed in our small selves. We're witnessing ourselves as something much bigger, something which is an expression of full consciousness, what we call the Big Self. Fear is based on the unknown and the possibility of death. And when we recognise this and meditate with the understanding that death is inevitable, after all, there is a 100% success rate, and that it's the end of our life, our body life, our small self-existence, we relax and become fearless because we know our big self, our field of consciousness, is bigger and more fulfilling than our small self, and will certainly outlast it. As Marishi Mahesh Yogi said so beautifully, fear is simply lack of self-confidence. And the basis of confidence is the contentment which can only come from the experience of bliss. There is nothing in the world which can really bring the mind lasting contentment because nothing in the world can provide a happiness which is intense enough to satisfy the mind's great thirst. The only field of contentment is the transcendental field of bliss consciousness. Unless one arrives at this state, one's peace will always be threatened by anything in the world. As a young child in my neighborhood, there were some very large dogs that would run about barking loudly and would sometimes chase after me. And this was really scary. And because of having those experiences, I developed a fear of dogs. 
I started to assume that all dogs behave the same way and any time that I would see a dog, large or small, I would begin to think about those past experiences and automatically be flipped into having a fight or flight response, believing that I would again be subjected to loud barking and being chased after, which just isn't true. And since then, I've adopted and reframed fear in a much more manageable way by referring to it as the acronym F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. Now, what do I mean by false evidence? Well, largely the false assumption that we are separate from one another. Well, the truth is we are actually one. From the Vedic perspective, there is only one thing, consciousness, and you are it. And that everything at its core is made up of the same one singular thing. Fear, however, would have us believe otherwise. Fear is one of the agents used by the ego to reinforce this false narrative of separation. And one of the ways it does this is by taking experiences from our past where we have felt trepidation, closed off and disconnected from our oneness. And it uses those experiences against us as evidence by projecting them onto our future leading us to believe that a future experience is going to be very much like an experience we had in the past. And this is exactly what was at play with my fear of dogs. So essentially, fear is when the ego presents evidence that appears to be real, but it is doing so falsely. And this is where we get false evidence appearing real, F-E-A-R, fear. Now, to be fair, this is the job of the ego, to protect us and preserve the identity it has created about who we are. It uses fear along with the fight or flight response as a defense mechanism, and it just wants us to be safe and keep us out of harm's way. The ego is necessary for our survival but it's being ruled primarily by the ego that is the issue. The problem is when we constantly view ourselves as separate. It is easier to become inhibited and even ruled by fear. It can keep us from moving forward and taking risks and left unchecked, we can even develop irrational fears that can cause us to freeze and become completely paralyzed. And this is a mistake. So what then is the solution for not letting fear get the best of us? And how can we embrace and better manage fear? In a word, meditation. Our meditation practice is the perfect remedy. It is the best way for us to be reminded of the truth of that which we really are, one, not separate. When we sit to meditate, quieting the mind and the body, experiencing deep rest where stress gets pushed out of our physiology. Along with it goes some of the fearful, irrational stress triggers planted there from our past. We connect to the source of our being, our oneness, by transcending thought and experiencing the absolute pure consciousness that we are. And furthermore, we are reminded of our true identity, that we are one. And consistently practicing meditation opens us up to a brighter, less fearful future than the one the ego paints for us. Where others see separation, we begin to see unity. And with our new vision of ourselves comes the dissolution of fear. It's great to put yourself in those extreme circumstances because it makes you makes every like normal life just seem like, oh, you know, that's fine. I can go and, um, you know, ask for that promotion or ask for the pay rise or ask that person out because that's nowhere near as bad as as jumping out of a plane. Um, well, I think jumping out of a plane 
is, you know, I've seen interviews of people, you know, before, you know, they're, they're get, about to get in the plane. You know, how are you feeling? Or oh, I feel sick. I feel, you know, they display all the classic symptoms of flight, you know, adrenaline, sweating, wanting to throw up. And, you know, they get to the door and with the instructor and they jump and they're screaming all the way down, um, which is a scream of terror, which then turns into a scream of what I assume is pleasure. The only time I've ever jumped out of a plane is in my dream. So I, I honestly can't speak from practical experience. And then they land. And then, you know, how do you feel? Fantastic, fantastic. I want to go back and do it again. Whereas, you know, two hours before, they almost had to be dragged and pushed into the plane. And so I think, you know, what you're talking about, Rory, is very interesting about pushing yourself, you know, to go for, you know, a bigger target, a bigger objective, you know, the bigger job or whatever it is. But I think when you're doing something as visceral as jumping out of a plane, you know, there's a chemical reaction going on there and people get addicted to it. You know, they get addicted to the roller coaster. They get addicted to the horror movie. This is, you know, they're purchasing a, a hit of fear because they just love that adrenaline boosting through them and they know it's pretty likely they're going to survive but it scares it scares them stupid literally stupid um and then it's all right and you know you get a lot i know a lot of people who are just addicted to horror movies you know they just love a horror movie they just love being in that state of high anxiety and i think you know, what we're talking about is we want to prevent getting into that state on a regular basis or, you know, what we actually would be quite good to avoid it at all times. And thank goodness we have a meditation practice which counterbalances that. But, but I absolutely agree with you. It gives you the confidence. It gives you the stability. You know, that's what we're talking about. It's really giving you the stability to then move forward fearlessly, you know, to evolve fearlessly, which we've talked about before. Um, which always comes back to evolving fearlessly because it's so important because many people won't do it because they're stuck in the ever repeating name. They're stuck in that, that, you know, that comfort zone, which, um, you know, has everything they want. So they believe. Well, I also thought it was really interesting though, Anthony, your example of fear inside the tube, because the the way that it can become contagious you know that maybe you are kind of fine you're not even really thinking anything fearful and then other people begin to demonstrate their own fear or their own anxiety and now you either second guess yourself or you're checking in you're taking your temperature again and it leads to this you know it, it, it's interesting how that scenario could have turned into a wild catastrophe of everyone just giving into their fear. When, and and the, the most interesting part of that, what your story, because I can relate to it from like the MTA in New York, is if someone were just to be able to come over and say, okay, we're going to be here for a moment, this and this is this is going to happen, it could alleviate so much fear, just a tiny little something. But left to our own devices, we imagine sometimes that's the thing with fear is it can flip us into the worst case scenario kind of thinking. And then when you're doing that with other people and it's a collective, it's like, oh my God, you know what I'm saying? And so I de that your example was so interesting because I definitely, I remember one time, you know, being stuck for quite a while and, you know, the intercoms don't work. And so everybody's going, what are we doing here? And all, all this stuff is, is, you know, coming out. And it's, it's interesting. I, you know, I don't have that reaction as much anymore. I'm, I'm, I will be waiting for some announcement or whatnot, but if it doesn't, I found a way to not get, let myself get involved in the hysteria that everybody else is experiencing. Yeah, I found um, I was on a business trip in America. I took a flight from LA to San Francisco and there was a lot of turbulence. I've flown a lot and that was probably up there amongst the top five most turbulent flights I've ever taken. And all around me, everybody went very, very quiet, extremely quiet. Um, and then I noticed people were crying or they were sort of literally biting their hands or, you know, I mean, they were terrified, absolutely terrified. 
but instead of it being expressed, it was contained. Everybody was hunkering down. And, you know, I, I was just okay. I mean, it was just a bumpy ride, you know. Um, and, you know, a, a pilot friend of mine said, um, you know, the wings are designed to flex enormously to the point that, you know, if you go through turbulence, they could almost reach up and do a double clap and then come down again. You know? It's kind of exaggerating. I've never seen that happen. Um, but, you know, I was just fine. But, but it spread through the, through the whole cabin. Everybody, was, everybody that I could see was, was very, very distressed. And then when we landed, you know, the plane erupted. You know, people were stand, st you know, please sit down. No, no, they'd all unbuckle themselves. They were standing up and clapping the captain, and they were, you know, they were just so pleased to be alive. But it had never, it had never seriously crossed my mind that that would happen. And I don't attribute that to, oh, I'm, I'm such a brave chap. It's the meditation was just there. It's just, you know, let's get this in perspective because, as you say, Derek. You know, you can start to speculate. It's the worst case scenario. And you, you think about all those other planes that have crashed. And yet, you know, you've got to fly, fly millions of miles before anything happens. You know, like a yeah. wheel falls off. You know, it's not, it's not the plane crashes. There's just a small hiccup. I think that's, that's a great point. Like a, a big difference for me is that not speculating as much about the future. And we've got these scenarios here where, you know, on the plane... You, your reaction doesn't really affect the outcome. Jumping out of a plane, the instructor's going to push me out the door, whatever. But then there are kind of more day-to-day -day situations where my reaction would completely change the, the outcome. So examples would be giving a presentation or giving, uh, being in a job interview, which are two things that I've noticed changes with as well. And if you're really nervous in a job interview and you're thinking this is going to be really bad, I'm going to stumble, you do do that. <laughs> and it means that you're going to be less likely to, to, to get that job or give a good presentation because of your reaction. So I guess we've been giving examples of a real white knuckle thing where you're not in control, but a lot of the time you, you are in control and your kind of stress reaction is going to have a material effect on the outcome. And that's, that's, you know, we talk about these extreme events, but I, the, the, the most useful things and some of the things I talk about when I teach is these more day-to-day -day things. And I think it was something like they did, when they do a survey, they say, what, what are you most afraid of? And people say public speaking over like death. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, the, the best public speakers that you see are the people who are, you know, the most relaxed and they're, They've not, they, they appear that they've not, not prepared. And you're not going to do that if you're carrying this, this kind of back level of st stress. So I guess, you know, not many people get into meditation to be a better public speaker, but that's one of the great things you get along the way. And it's the kind of beauty of it is it's not like you're going to see a therapist and you're saying, right, here are my phobias, here are my fears. Let's, let's work through these one by one. But then over the years, you, you notice, oh, I'm, I'm okay with this. Oh, I'm okay with this. I'm okay with this. And, you know, we can't unpick that from getting older. Like we're all maturing and getting older every day anyway, and we'll get benefit from that. But there's, there's you know, there's a definite before and after, I think, with meditation in, in our ability to... to cope with any situation, not, not just the white knuckle ones, but the more day-to-day -day ones, which is, you know, amazing to, to watch in yourself and in students. Well, I agree hundred percent. And I also think, you know, it's the relationship with fear that changes, you know, whether it's the white knuckle situation or the day-to-day -day one. And I think for me, and especially, you know, what's going on in the world right now, what I think is interesting is there's a lot of reason to be fearful, you know? And like what Anthony, what you were saying too, is like, I think we're all largely afraid of this body expiring and what that's going to be like, either because we don't know, or we think we don't know what happens after, or that the loss of this body is going to be painful. And so somehow, almost every fear can probably be traced to our 
body's death. You know, I get that. And because we're all pretty much here on the planet because we've had fear introduced into our chemistry when we get into a situation that is probably not a great one, you know, like it, there, there are healthy doses of fear that we need to have in order to maintain this. So I, I, I totally understand it. I think what happens is where fear gets out of control and what we're seeing now is also not only because of this idea of my body's not going to last, but this idea of separation, you know, where I'm seeing everybody else as something different or separate from myself. And then that might be something to fear because they're going to take from me something that I need to survive again. And, and meditation, you know, is a perfect reminder of the oneness that we really share and that we are this one thing. And you and I and everyone else, make no mistake, is one thing just sequenced a bit differently and express an expression of the oneness a little bit differently. And I would imagine the more people can remember what the truth is of who we are, that we're one over separate, that that also is a way of diminishing fear because we're not thinking so much about all the body itself and this, I'm, I'm just this, I'm everything, right? This is just, a, a version of myself. And so I always wonder too, like if people thought like, oh, whenever it happens to my body, I will still be going on. This, this never really ends. Would we behave with each other differently? Especially right now where it's like, there's a lot of fear. This, what's gonna happen? What should I do? Why did this happen kind of a thing? And I think the thing that I keep reminding my students of is, you know, practice your practice. Remember your oneness. Remember the truth of, of who you are. And then that will allow you to start seeing your oneness in what everybody else is seeing as, as separate. Uh, and I think it's a really important message to be putting out there right now, especially. I absolutely agree. I think, you know, what we're seeing is, um, you know, many different um, themes which are perpetuating the idea of otherness, you know, which is what you're talking about, Derek, you know, it's your other. So therefore you're not part of one. And this is, you know, what I was talking about in my video is the small self. This is small self thinking. It's me, 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 me. And that is very much based on the ego. And going back to the point that Rory was making about, you know, being nervous, uh, making a presentation or, you know, on the, if you, as, and I agree, because that's the point I was making that, that ultimately, ultimately the, the thing that we're most frightened of is death, but, but also it's the ego being damaged or attacked. And, you know, that, that makes people terrified. You know, I'm not, my, my good standing is going to be compromised. I'm going to be made to look a fool. I'm going to be look, look stupid. Um, and, you know, this is all small self thinking. And once we relax about that, and this is what meditation teaches us so beautifully, because every time we meditate, we're not connecting only with ourselves, but we're also connecting with nature's creativity. So we're coming in, but we're also going out then we start to understand and recognize the oneness, the bigger self rather than the smaller self. And we recognize that actually there is no other or otherness, that we are all the same, that we are all part of one thing of that greater creative intelligence and that greater creative consciousness. Um, and I think what we're seeing at the moment is a lot of small thinking, a lot of small, small self, behaving inappropriately. Um, yeah, it's interesting your point, Anthony, about all fears being fear of death. Ultimately, I was doing this NLP course a few years ago, neuro-linguistic programming, and they were 
they have a thing where they try and, you know, they're trying to overcome your fears and they said, right, hands up who's got a fear or a phobia. And everyone was saying, yeah, public speaking, dogs, uh, heights. And I've got this weird fear about dead fish. I, I freak out if I, if I go to a fish market and see dead fish, I'm, you know, I'm not in a good way. So they were like, okay, fish boy up, you're getting on the stage. We're going to, we're going to do you. <laughs> and you know, they did all these different techniques on me to try and, you know, um, take the, the power out of my memories and stuff, which, which I'm not sure that they worked, but what it did provoke me to do is later in the day, I was thinking, well, why am I, what have I got this phobia of fish? And then I remembered back to my childhood and how my first pet was, was two goldfish. And I went to school one day and came back and they were, they were dead at the top of the, at the top of the tank. So this was the first thing in the world that I'd known to die. Mm. So they are a reminder for me of death. So I'm not, uh, you know, scared of dead fish. I'm scared of death. And having that kind of revelation just went, ah, oh, well, that's you know a bit more, a bit more normal because that's a that's a kind of common common fear. So that's you know that's one level. But then we get to this next one that you were talking about, Derek. Of you know what 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 is death? You know, in the Vedic system, it's more about body death and that we we continue and that we're all part of this you know natural evolutionary cycle. And you know you don't that's probably in the further reaches of what you, you might investigate, but, but having that, however you want to think about it, whatever helps for you to get into that confident position where you can do live your life how you want to. And, and yeah, knowing that we have that oneness below, I think the other interesting part about the situation at the moment is that we have that, um, the, the Jung calls it the shadow. So anything that we see as other, that's the shadow. And it, it helps us to realize that all those shadow elements, you know, whether that's brutality or anger or ignorance, they're all parts of ourselves and none of us are kind of pure beings. So we just see that part of ourselves in, in others and then kind of attack it in others. But what our meditation practice helps us do is, work on that in our, in ourselves. So rather than getting outraged about what other people are doing, we can say, well, hang on, where, where does my anger sit? And what, what am I, what do I get unnecessarily angry about? And through meditation, we find that, you know, I felt that my anger has diminished over the years. And that doesn't mean that we become, you know, inert or we don't change anything, but it means that we are more aware of what we have control over changing. So I can control my, how much fear and anger and you know hatred I'm putting out into the world a lot more than I can people tens of thousands of, of miles away. Well, it's interesting that you say that because I feel like that's also tied into what Anthony you talked about in your video is the fear of the unknown. You know, like I think we all that resonates with almost everybody. We don't know what's going to happen, whether we think there's going to be some kind of harm that's going to cause us death or something of that nature. We, we like to understand things, or we, at least we think we like to understand things. And as a kid as well, maybe you guys can share on this too, but I was also afraid of the dark, you know, and what shadows would be created and whatnot. And that's largely about not knowing what's going to happen because the lights are out. You, you, you speculate, you hear a noise or whatnot. I mean, I had a very vivid imagination, so I thought all kinds of things would happen. But it was interesting, the other night I was watching um, an episode or some TV story about Jeffrey Dahmer, which I knew kind of who he was, but not really, I didn't know the full story. And that guy did some pretty scary stuff, pretty scary stuff. And the show was over <laughs> and I was hungry and I had to go to the kitchen, but it was absolutely dark. And as I walked to the kitchen, I had to keep reminding myself because I, I couldn't see. I didn't know how far it was to the kitchen or to this thing. And so my mind was flooded with, what if Jeffrey Dahmer showed up right now? What if, you know, all these different scenarios simply because I didn't know. And 
then I started to calm down again because it's like, this is silly. Like, this is all just because you just saw the show too and all these other kinds of things. And so I think meditation also helps us kind of move in the direction of the unknown with less fear, definitely for me, than before. Because I think, you know, again, when we need to make a change or we want to make a change and we're dying for it, we know we can't stay in this relationship any longer or this city or this house, one of the reasons we don't change is because we're, we're afraid or we're fearful of what's going to happen. We don't know. We'd rather stay and continue in something that's familiar, even though if it's unpleasant or even painful, because we know it. You know, and, you know, that's why I think we often, you know, give people praise and say how courageous they are for getting out of that situation, doing something else, because you don't know how it's going to play out. But I've also understood now more than ever through meditation, how important it is to move to and through the unknown in a way that I don't need to be fearful of, largely because I understand the way that nature works and how it's progressing. And with all of the change that I've had before becoming a teacher and afterwards, it becomes even more evident with every meditation and every day that as I continue moving in the direction of the unknown, what I need to know reveals itself as it's happening, which I did not have clarity or even the understanding of that before meditation. And I'm sure you guys have similar experiences with that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, people put an enormous amount of effort into resisting change. You know, I mean, they'll, they'll spend money, they'll, they'll spend time, they'll spend a huge amount of effort. And if only the same time and effort was, instead of resisting it, was turned into embracing it and going for the ride, you know, th life would actually be so much, so much easier and so much more interesting. Because, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure all, 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 everybody has come across some very, very wealthy people. I've come across in my former work, you know, incredibly wealthy people who the wealthier, the wealthier they were or are, the more they worried about holding on to it all. They were terrified of losing it. Mm. And, you know, whether that was security guards or having their own airplane or whatever it was, you know, it was all crazy, crazy stuff. They became a prisoner of, of that situation. And, you know, they, they would step out of that very, very reluctantly, very reluctantly, because they were fearful they were going to lose all the money and go back to square one. Have you, um, have you read the... Uh... The Sapiens and, and Homo Deus, those books. Sapiens, yeah. Um, Yuval Harari. So he's he's um, like he's he's a historian. I think that's his 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 subject. But he, you know, Sapiens talks about the history of humankind up to now, and then Homo Deus talks about the future. Um, and there's this idea that the way technology is going and, and nanotechnology, we will get to a stage where we can make death. Um, not inevitable so we'll be able to fix any heart disease we'll be able to reverse the aging process so that but it'll only be available to the super rich because it will be you know they'll it will be expensive but we'll get to this stage where some people will be able to be um immortal because because of technology except they won't be able to protect against accidental death they'll only be able to protect against aging and and um you know disease so it means that you know the way he says it in the book is that they'll become so fearful and protective of what they have because you imagine like someone who's a billionaire in their 50s how rich are they going to be when they're 300 <laughs> and they'll get to a point where they're not living because they they've got too much to hold on to which is a kind of dystopian uh idea <laughs> idea of the future where you're so You've got so much to lose 
that you're not prepared to do anything like in the book i think he says look they, they just wouldn't leave their house or they probably wouldn't even have stairs in their house because that would be too risky um mm. which is a bit of a, a crazy idea i guess the the opposite of fear would be you know an opposite would be trust so it's going i'm, I'm going to trust that whatever happens it will be okay and you know even if that involves me falling over and hurting myself or losing money or losing my job we have that trust that the universe is working for us and that the result will be okay and the more we try and control what's going to happen the work the worse the situation is going to be and we you know i think anthony you're talking about that that wasted energy we have in i used to spend so much time speculating about the future like <clears throat> whether it's you know, how's that presentation going to go? How's this meeting going to go? How's this date going to go? And you spend all this time imagining what it's going to be like. And it means that when you get there, you're not actually experiencing how it is. You're just comparing, you know, did I imagine that the restaurant was going to be <laughs> as I thought it was going to be? So you're, which means you're disconnected because you're just referring to this, this stuff in your head the whole time, which is, you know, it's exhausting compared to just being like, I'm going to turn up. I'm going to trust that my reactions in the moment are going to be appropriate um, and they're going to be more appropriate if you are there in the moment rather than thinking, now I've prepared these five different speeches, which is the correct one. So I think, you know, once you get out of that speculative mindset, which is another natural byproduct of sitting down and working out your stresses by, you know, we come back to our mantra, we come back to our mantra and those things, those things go and it's one of the greatest benefits for me is not having to spend all that energy. Obviously I still think about some stuff in the future, but nowhere near as much. It just used to be kind of endless. And it's, it's a, such a relief not to have to do that anymore. I absolutely agree because I think you can become, you know, quite neurotic with that. You know, it, it becomes, it becomes almost an illness that you're constantly, you know, and to the point where you don't actually do anything. Um, you know, and I think, I think, you know, we always want, you know, we always want to do things from a higher state of consciousness. You know, we don't, we don't necessarily need to be told what to do. Um, you know, nature will point things out to us and perhaps we're ignoring them and we ignore those things, not necessarily at our peril, but, you know, we're just ignoring it, which means we can see it, but we choose not to take action. Um, and, you know, I'm just reminded of um, Tony Robbins, you know, who sometimes at his big uh, talks, you do the fire walk, you know, which uh, and I know a couple of people have done it. And, uh, you know, you come away incredibly empowered. You know, you've done it. You've walked across, you know, whatever it is, 20 meters of hot, hot coals and you haven't got a blister on your foot. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, so what? You know, so you prove to yourself you can walk, but you know, it's the daily application. And I think this is where meditation is so brilliant. And what the point you make, Rory, that, that you know, you're every day you're reconnecting to that and you're just, you're just finessing that trust in yourself and the realization that, that, that now is, is what's so important. Now is all we've got. Okay. Thank you for watching until the end. Each episode we offer a takeaway, a practical exercise you can do at home to apply this knowledge in your own life. In this episode, we were talking about overcoming fear and how to move past the things that are holding us back. This week, your task is to be brave. We're asking you to summon up your courage and do something you've been putting off for a while because you haven't yet found the courage to do so. It could be asking out that person you've had your eye on or bringing up something with your boss that you've been avoiding. Pick something that's meaningful for you and don't delay. Act on your decision and then reap the benefits. If you're happy to share your stories, we'd love to hear them and for you to join the conversation. Please send them through to us at stories at thevedicconversation.com or post them on social media with the hashtag thevedicconversation. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with your followers and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you next time.